Podium Audio presents Welcome to TBRCon 2024. I'm Danny Finn, they, them, fantasy romance author and blogger with Before We Go Blog. We're here to, to talk about writing non-human characters. Uh, I write about hairy humanoids called the mayor, among other things. So writing non-human characters is a special interest of mine. I'm here with a star-studded panel, uh, including Travis Baldry, Andrea Stewart, Michael R. Miller, J. Zachary Pike, and Nick Scrimger. And I'm overflowing with excitement to hear about what they have to say on the topic. We're going to jump right in with introductions. Uh, authors, please introduce yourself. Uh, give your pronouns if you like, and tell us the name of the non-human creatures you're best known for and the book they first appear in. Uh, let us start with Travis. Hi, I'm Travis Boldry. I'm the author of uh, Legends and Lattes and Bookshops and Bone Dust, and I'm also uh, an audiobook narrator. I am best known for the characters in the only two books I have written, uh, which include Viv, an orc who eventually retires to open a coffee shop, Thimble, a ratkin who bakes, Fern, a ratkin who swears and sells books, and Pot Roast, uh, Griffith, who's basically part pug, part owl. Excellent. And uh, Andrea? Uh, I'm Andrea Stewart, and I'm best known for the Drowning Empire trilogy. Uh, and probably, as far as non-human characters go, people will know me for the Ocelin in my books, which is like a made-up creature <laughs> that's an animal companion. And the one that most people know the best is Mephi. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Michael? Uh, yeah, uh, Mike Barmiller, uh, best known for the Songs of Chaos series, which is ongoing. Uh, it's a Dragon Rider epic. Um, though most of the POV characters are human. None have been POV from the non-human perspective so far. There was lots of creatures in the series. There are phoenixes, yetis, uh, a few other things to come that I can't say because that would be spoilers. Uh, and of course, the dragons, and uh, probably the, the best well-known of that cast is Ash, who is the blind dragon, our main dragon hero of the series. Wonderful, thank you, and Zachary. Hey, uh, I'm Zach Pike, uh, author of the Dark Prophet Saga. Um, I'm best known for writing uh, Gorm Ingerson, who is a dwarf, um, and Katha, who is an elf. And I just have all kinds of fun, classic fantasy peoples in my book. Sounds fantastic. And uh, Nick? Yeah, I'm N.C. Scrimger, um, and I'm a sci-fi and fantasy author, um, probably best known for the Waystations trilogy, which is like a kind of action-packed space opera so as far as non-human characters go, um, lots of various different um, aliens in there and a couple of point of view characters. Um, and then also in my new fantasy series, um, I'm focusing on um, Selkies, so kind of Scottish folklore creatures kind of with a little bit of a twist. Uh, wonderful. I know a, a few people in particular who are going to be interested in that. OK, so imagine I'm walking down the streets of a fantasy town or Cloud City, Mountain Trail, Desert Moon island, what have you, and I come across a group of these non-human characters or NHCs as we'll call them from now. No, we're not going to do that, but what would my first impression of them be and would that impression be wrong? Uh, Andrea? Oh gosh, I think it probably depends on what size they are at the time. <laughs> so if you encounter like the baby ones, they're quite small. They're like uh, probably about the size of a, like a weasel, like a large weasel or a cat. Uh, you probably think they're pretty cute, uh, and they're very mischievous, so they're probably going to be trying to get into your food. All right. Uh, how about you, uh, Michael? Uh, well, I mean, they're dragons, so <laughs> what you see is probably what you get, although uh, with with mine, they uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to tell at face value because they are... They're such varied personalities, and they are—you uh, wouldn't know necessarily if they're going to 
eat you or help you. Um, so you'd have to be a bit wary of them before you do anything. I mean, could you read the personality of a dragon on their face? Do they have facial expressions or are their faces just not have, moved that way? No, they have facial expressions. I actually, in one book, in the third book, I actually wrote in that they were smiling until my um, editor pointed out that they hadn't smiled in the previous two books. And I was like, oh, okay, better take that out. Uh, but they can they can make very um, aggressive faces. They can you know, move that. They've got kind of like eye ridges. They can, they can express, but for some reason they can't smile. So you'd have an idea. You know, if they're growling and snarling and their eyes are narrowed, then... There's, there's magic gathering at their breath, and it's probably best to stand back. But um, they might they might end up if you give you a lick as well. Depends on their mood. <laughs> uh, excellent. Uh, how about you, Zach? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, from a distance, most of the most of the folks in my books look like people, but as you get close to a dwarf, they're typically stout and cranky looking and bearded. And uh, you know, I like writing people like that because. It's familiar. <laughs> How tall are your dwarves? Uh, I think uh, I, I say somewhere around four and a half to, to five foot. Usually, like describe them as a head shorter than a human. Okay. And what about the elves you write about? Uh, they're a little taller than humans, so probably I don't know, like six five. Okay. All right. Uh, how much to ask a dwarf type? What's that? Is it okay. to ask a dwarf type? <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about you, Nick? Um, yes, yeah, so Selkies, maybe for anyone that um, doesn't know, are kind of a creature from Scottish folklore that take the form of a seal in the water, um, but can kind of shed their pelt and sort of act and, and pass as a, a human on land. So if you walk past one on the street, you might not necessarily recognise them for what they are. Um, if you saw them in seal form, you'd probably um, maybe think they were, you know, cute and peaceful. Uh, but you'd be wrong. They definitely have to. And um, yeah, I think that's one of the the kind of um, ways I, I guess try and subvert the sort of you know romantic side of the Selkie myth is by giving them yeah a little bit more more of a bite. Now you said you wouldn't recognize them on the street. Would one Selkie recognize another on the street? Are there little like subtle signs or jewelry or something that you might notice? Yeah, so when they come out of the water and shed their pelt, they wear it as clothing. And I think humans wouldn't recognize it for what it was, but another Selkie would would recognize that that was one of their own their own pelts. All right, interesting. All right, cool. Uh, how about you, Travis? Um, so, I mean, for me, I think kind of a major thematic component of what I write is that who people are doesn't have much to do with what they are. So almost all of the characters I have are, are generally high contrast. So you have an orc of making a small business brewing coffee and you have a succubus who's basically ace and you have a short, cute rat person who's baking and another short, cute rat person who swears. And um, they're almost always, part of the point is that they aren't what you would expect. So you, I'm assuming you would probably be surprised. Excellent. Um, I guess my other next question would be, how did you first come up with the idea of writing non-human characters and why these creatures specifically, like what drew you to the ones that you decided to write? Uh, why don't we start, I want to start with Zach, uh, cause I want to know why, what about dwarves, uh, made you say, you know, I'm going to write though. I mean, I, I've written about dwarves myself, so like, I know why I wanted to write them, but like, what made you think dwarves? Yeah, let's do this. <laughs> I mean, I, I think uh, I, I started these books when I was much younger, uh, so I was uh, always really kind of enthralled with tabletop RPGs and, uh, you know, video game RPGs. And, and those were the characters that kind of, and, and I was a big Tolkien fan, so those were all the characters that I kind of came up with. But in time, I just came to appreciate what a, what a shorthand they are for kind of, you know, personalities or cultural um, cultural significance in terms of dwarves are, are seen a certain way and elves are seen a certain way. And, and so that gives you something fun to work with. It gives you a common language to work with and something to subvert. And, um, you know, so that was why I wanted to, to kind of include all of those races in my book. Uh, and then in terms of why to make a, a, a the main character a dwarf is the more I, the more I wrote about him, the more it was apparent that that was kind of the personality he had. It was kind of a, a good hearted curmudgeon and it was fun. So you talked about subverting. So what what do you subvert about dwarves in your books? So I, I think uh, I think when it comes to dwarves, they're probably the ones that I that I, I do uh, play the straightest, uh, just in terms okay. of you know like that personality and, and uh, like everything. But 
I, I like to uh, I like to uh, kind of put them in different roles. So the main character in the book is a dwarf, and he's a, a hero, and I think he's more what you would expect. But one of the chief uh, antagonists in the book is uh, is Fenrir Goldson, who owns Goldson and Bags, the the evil megacorp. And you know, so they kind of play both sides. It's not the dwarves; it's this big monoculture that's good or bad. It's dwarven people in a society being good or bad. Very good, uh, Nick. How about you? Uh, what what drew you to writing uh, Selkies and uh, and non-human characters in general? And so for me, when I kind of did the swap from sci-fi to fantasy, I really wanted to, being from Scotland myself, I kind of wanted to draw on something from sort of Scottish folklore and mythology. Um, and I'd say probably Selkies are probably quite um, sort of underlooked character in terms of your sort of like your fantasy staples. So it was quite nice to take something that maybe wasn't quite as well known, um, but also because there's not been that much written about them before, there's like so much scope for then sort of expanding and developing. So I kind of was wanting to take the existing sort of mythology behind this kind of silky creature, but then also develop a whole load of like lore and culture um, and sort of, yeah, different different ways of looking at it. So yeah, that was the the, the big draw for me. Right on. Uh, how about you, Travis? Um, well, I mean, the real answer is that because I've always liked fantasy fiction and have liked, you know, series like The Hobbit and and Redwall and, and all of this fiction over the course of my life. I mean, that's why I write this stuff. It's because I like it. But if I wanted to retroactively apply some answer that makes it seem like some forethought went into it, I would probably say that um, using non-human characters allows you to literalize something true about the character. You can make, you can physicalize it. And so, for instance, Viv is someone who feels out of place. She feels awkward around other people. She doesn't feel like she fits in. And so she is enormous she stands out in a crowd she uh, people have uh, a reaction to her physical presence that is like a literalization of the way that she feels when she interacts with people and it's nice to be able to use that as kind of a shorthand for what's true about a character love it that's a textbook beautiful answer how about you andrea well i mean when i sit down to write a book i generally think about all the things that I enjoy reading in other books. And one of the things that I've always enjoyed reading are animal companions. So I knew that I wanted to have animal companions in this series um, because I just love the relationship that people can have with, I mean, in this case, it's not just like, it's not like a pet, right? It's more like a friend, a faithful, loyal companion that you're like bonded to for life. So I, I, it's like a wish fulfillment in a lot of ways. So I knew I wanted to have that, and I kind of put a lot of traits into these creatures that I have really enjoyed in the like best companion animals that I've had in my life. So, so it was kind of like that. It was like a lot of wish fulfillment. And then there's very, very specific plot reasons to have them there um, and to have them existing the way that they are in this world. So, Right on. And how about you, Michael? Uh, Not that you need a reason it. for dragons, obviously, but... No, no. Do you need a reason for dragons? <laughs> uh, need a reason not to write dragons. Uh, right. A little similar to Travis, similar to Andrew, a little bit of, of, of what they said kind of applies. I mean, I, once I decided I wanted to write, uh, try my hand at the Dragon Rider epic, you naturally have to write a whole bunch of dragons. Um, but, you know, with, the, with that subgenre, a huge part of the appeal is a uh, bit what well, Andrew said it's that there's the bond but in, in the dragon rider fantasy you know the super bond the, the soul bond is very very important it's kind of like having your own like your best friend pet as a dragon so to speak but it's you know times a billion because it's a dragon everything's sort of cranked up to 11. I, I think dragons can represent cranking everything up to 11 uh whether they're an evil dragon whether they're a good dragon whatever they are everything can be exaggerated to an extreme um, they can be the, the, the greatest villain, they can be the greatest hero, uh, they can be the source of the power to save the world and the power to destroy the world. And that kind of songs encompasses all of that. You've got the whole, there's every type of, of character in, in, in those dragons. So they give you this great scope and you can go really balls to the walls and make someone really quite, it would almost be comical if it was a person, I think, but because it's a dragon and they seem primordial, 
you can push it a lot further and it can be really fun and, and inventive that way. And then when I wanted to bring some of these other creatures into the series, there's like a, a phoenix and a bit like um, Travis saying that you can, you know, literalize something about it and you can subvert stuff from, from other folk have been saying, you know, phoenixes we think of as being uh, one way, often quite noble, quite uh, graceful creatures, I think often from Harry Potter and they're seen as like healing. But I was like, no, they're made of fire, so this one's going to be full of rage and vengeance, and you can just sort of twist that around, but also play into some of the aesthetics that that it has and create something really, hopefully, memorable out of it. So, yeah, I think I think Andrew and Travis got there first and said it better, but kind of a combo of that uh, would apply to me as well. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> so this next question was not on the list I sent you, so pardon me, there's a little bit of a curveball. I think it's an interesting one. Um, well, I hope so. Um, I got to thinking about question of uh, gender and sexuality as it relates to non-human characters, because when you have characters that are not, you know, as familiar, you have maybe a little bit more freedom. Uh, so my question is, do your characters follow sort of the usual human patterns or are there any differences? And we'll start with uh, Michael for this one. Uh, no, they're pretty, they fall, the, the dragons pretty much fall into male or female. Um, I haven't really gone down to explore those sorts of routes. It didn't feel like it was the, the series for that, and nor was I necessarily the, the best person to to uh, to go and explore that. So, uh, unfortunately, it's a quick answer on that, but uh, not for me. No, it's just, just male or female on those dragons. Okay, that's quite all right. How about you, uh, Zach? Uh, so, I, I think uh, most of the people are going to fall in the traditional roles. Uh, I think a couple of notable, notable example, uh, exemptions are like uh, doppelgangers. Uh, are, are genderless, so I guess they're all kind of they them, but they can adopt either gender as, as they go. So um, they're one exception. And then the other one is dwarves. There are only male dwarves, and that's something I'm looking at exploring in another book. But... I have a lot of questions. <laughs> Most people do, yeah. <laughs> right on. Uh, how about you, Nick? Um, yeah, in Sea of Souls, the fantasy series, again, it's, it kind of falls pretty much into the sort of traditional, um, but in uh, the Waystations trilogy, there is um, one of my kind of alien races. Um, they kind of change sex throughout their lives, um, back and forward as they kind of see fit. So, yeah, that was that was quite yeah, fun to explore. So, like, they could just decide at any time? Yeah. Or is uh, it more environmental or...? Just no, whatever. It's, it's, it's kind of choice and how they feel and when they feel like it, um, and and they tend to to do it kind of multiple times, kind of through through their life, and um, I think as yeah, such they're yeah, they kind of pansexual as well. Um, so yeah, it was really is a kind of fun concept to explore. And what series is that? Uh, that's the Waystations trilogy. So that's the that's the sci-fi one, one of the the alien races, the the Iskath. Got it. Okay, excellent. Uh, how about you, Travis? Um, so, uh, the, the aim of my books in a lot of ways is kind of to open the door as wide as possible and to be as welcoming as possible. So, um, characters have different gender orientations and my expectation is that, um, because the world really has what I'd consider modern, uh, moral values and approach that anything and everything would be represented. Um, uh, if, if it's represented in people that we know, it would be represented there. Makes perfect sense. How about you, Andrea? Well, I mean, in the books themselves, I think all the ones that you see are like male or female, but my thought was that the Ocelon would basically um, mirror whatever person they're with. So just basically depending on their gender and their identity, they would be mirroring the person they're bonded to. Um, so that was my thought with that. Okay. Um, let's see. The, uh, next up, I have a question I was thinking about um, when you're writing, particularly if you're writing from the point of view of these characters, and I know that that's not always the case for each of you, um, but have you ever struggled getting into fully into the mindset of, of these creatures like as not human? Um, or when you're writing, do you just kind of naturally enter into like the fugue state where you like are this creature or did it take you time to develop that ability to to get into the mindset of writing from a character that wasn't human uh and we'll start with uh nick for this one 
Yeah, so for me, I um, tend to be like, I suppose a bit sort of, I don't want to say distance, but quite like analytical sort of when it comes to my characters and developing characters. So I'm not really one of those writers who'll kind of really get into and be like, oh, you, you know, my character did this on their own and I just had to sort of, you know, go with it. I, I think I come at it quite a sort of maybe distant and an, like analytical approach. So when I'm writing non-human characters, before I even tend to write the story, I think I put together a sort of like fact file or, or kind of notes on, you know, what what they are, kind of what characteristics they're going to have. Um, so f with the with the Selkies, for instance, there was obviously that kind of pre-existing um, folklore. Um, and one of the things that tends to come up in the traditional myth is that if a Selkie's pelt is stolen from them, um, you know, then they can't return to to the water. So one of the first things that I sort of wanted to develop was, well, if you have your like literal soul taken away from you and you can't go back to the place that you're meant to be, what does that then? have an effect on the person how does it have an effect on their body so there's a bit of like kind of physical not quite body horror but there, there's stuff that goes on um in, in the books that if a silk is felt stolen from them that's going to have like a physical emotional mental effect so i think for me i, I kind of come up with sort of the yeah the background and and the lore um, and everything before I actually get into the story itself. So I think when it comes to to then writing, I've got a pretty good idea of you know where where I want to take the characters and kind of what situations I want to put them in to kind of explore those things. So for you, the the preparation allows you to do that without having to enter into like a method acting of writing. Yeah, or whatever. yeah, I would say so. Okay, great. Uh, how about you, Zach? Uh, yeah, I I, I think. Um... I don't do any fugue state. I'm not like drinking a lot of beer to write my dwarves or anything like that. But uh, I, I think uh, a lot of times these these characters are, are a neat way to kind of explore human emotions. And they're all non-human, but they're all close enough to humanity that I, I, I tend not to think too much about that. And, and it's more like thinking of other cultures. And, and, and you know what I mean? Like it's, you've got to put yourself in, the, in someone else's position to write these books. You can't just write yourself, but at the same time, none of my characters are so far from humanity that, you know, it, it's not like they're silicon based aliens or anything like that. <laughs> well, you, you are predicting a couple of uh, future questions that we'll get, I'm going to get back to the thing about other cultures and how far from humanity we would write. Um, well, that's good. How about you, Michael? The question uh, being, I, I don't you know, think, few, yeah, yeah, I don't think any, any more or less than other characters. It's about trying to find, make sure you understand their emotion, uh, their motivation, what they would be feeling in the scene emotionally, regardless. Um, the, I don't write from their perspective directly, um, so the physicality doesn't often come into account. And so you're just, but you know, I can see that physicality on the page. I think in some ways, the more, the more different they are, can sometimes be easier because you make them so different in a kind of couple of key ways that it becomes kind of fun and a, a different way of writing that you're not having to think in the usual path. But unless the the emotion and the motivation of the character is clear, it's just as difficult as any of the human characters. Yeah. So all that has to be there uh, bef be or else I'll, I'll struggle like anyone else. Yeah. Um, uh, how about you, Andrew? Um, well, I've never written from the point of view of the Ocelin, so that's not really getting into their perspective, um, but they are not humanoid. They're more animal-like, although they do talk and learn to read and things like that. Um, but I often think about like the like animal behavior, like uh, the ones that I compare the most often to are like otters or cats. And so, you know, they're very, they're very food motivated in a lot of ways. And, <laughs> And then the way that they behave, it, I, I think a lot about uh, a cat that I used to have who was always extremely curious, got into everything and caused me a lot of frustration, but also a lot of joy. So I see them a lot like that. And that's just what I think about when I write them. Do you think you ever would write from their point of view? You know, that's hard. Um, if, I, if the idea ever occurred to me. Uh, Are they like human so. equivalent intelligence or? Um, well, it depends on how old they are. So when they start out, they're definitely not like they don't know how to talk and they don't know anything about the world. Um, and then 
by the time they get much older, then it's definitely like an equivalent human human intelligence, if not more so. I, I see a middle grade series in your future. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I don't know about that. <laughs> Talk to you, Rachel. Right? Um, how? What do you? How about you, Travis? I mean, I I guess it gets down to what your aim is with your characters and your creatures and your story. Um, I mean, you can use the tools and trappings of fantasy to try and accomplish different things. If you're trying to do kind of fantasy tourism where you're exposing the reader to different cultures and ideas and taking that kind of like alien element where you're immersing yourself in another place. I mean, that's one approach. My approach is much, <laughs> uh, much more mundane, I guess. I end up using the fantasy creatures and fantastical elements to basically kind of gild everyday people and to remind you that they're worth talking about. So almost all of my characters are just very, very human and they're intended to be because that's more or less the point is to kind of um, be a reminder that those things are worthy of, of interest and have real value. So you're not you're not so much writing from the point of view of a succubus. You're writing from the point of view of a person. And I'm, the funny, succubus and I'm like using and I'm using the idea of a succubus and uh, the idea of her sexual orientation to talk about a way of feeling that's relatable to people who have felt that way, and it's a way of again kind of like literalizing that. And so, it's ultimately all about how how human can I make this non-human character? Right. I love it. Um, so. Is there something liberating about writing these non-human characters uh, that you wouldn't have if you were just writing humans? Uh, I mean, obviously, there's got to be something, um, but beyond just the the obvious, uh, Zach, we'll start with you on this one. Yeah, what's I, liberating I, about writing dwarves and elves? <laughs> I think with uh, with dwarves and elves and and all of those, you can kind of go somewhere uh, that you you wouldn't necessarily go with with the person in terms of just. Uh, making comments about how they feel or, um, or, or, or I don't know, like if I, if I was writing in the real world, I think I'd, I'd kind of be always stricken with analysis paralysis, you know, like if, if you ever heard that phrase where I got to research these people a little bit better, I got to understand this a little bit better. But one of the wonderful things about writing fantasy is you can just say, okay, this is where I want to take it. This is where I want to, I want it to go. And so again, with, with those non-human creatures that are kind of common to fantasy, they come with all kinds of expectations that you can play with and, and either, you know, subvert or use as you like. And uh, I, I think that's, that's really wonderful. Is it also a little constraining at times? Or do you feel constrained by the by the lore that already exists and people's expectations, et cetera? Or is it more liberating than constraining? I think it's more liberating than constraining for me. I mean, again, this is like Travis was saying, I love this stuff. This is this is what I read. I, I like elves and dwarves and orcs. They're they're fun. Uh, so I, I like to, to bring them. But if there's anything that isn't serving me or my story about them, I mean, fantasy is open enough that you can say, OK, this is a place where I'm going to take it in a different direction. And it just gives them more depth. Okay. Uh, how about you, Michael? What's liberating about writing dragons or writing about dragons? What isn't? I think I probably mentioned. <laughs> what was that? I said, what isn't liberating about writing dragons? <laughs> um, the, or the fact that if you start to think about them and to get too literal about it and you think, how are these things going to eat? How would you keep them? Like, it starts to boggle the mind. And so you have to start hand waving a whole lot of stuff and making up excuses like, oh, once they get older, they don't eat that much anymore. It's fine. <laughs> don't, don't worry about it, you know? Uh, I, like that, that's always of, bothered me. There's no way that, that any land could s support the amount of food a dragon would require. But that's a really good way to get rid of that problem. Isn't no, it? You, there isn't. There isn't. Honestly, there isn't. I mean, the, the, you think about the Game of Thrones ones in particular, how they just keep getting bigger. And a lot of dragons in fantasy are like this. I think they were like this inherent, an inherited cycle. Like it's in the Song of Ice and Fire. They just continuously get bigger forever. Like, you wouldn't be able to sustain that. Presumably, they'd have to just constantly eat. They would eat out your entire kingdom of, like, cattle. And you would have to have your entire military functioning just to logistically give this thing you know, food, and then it maybe gets like one shot off or something, you know, like, but, um, so yeah, I tried to hand wave that, like they're smaller, and as they get older, they just magically don't need to eat as much. <laughs> because it's all volume it's and no idea. density. And, yeah, it's just magic, okay? I don't know. They <laughs> only weigh about 300 pounds, but they're kind of like marshmallows. They're just extremely fluffy. <laughs> uh, some are, some are fluffy, some are prickly. Um, what was the question liberating? I think, um, <laughs> 
<laughs> um, I think I touched on it earlier, just that you, you, I, if you want to, you can go to some extreme places and do stuff that would be weird for a human to do. You can, you can have, I, you know, so, so in, in Songs of Chaos, there are there are an awful lot of dragons, aren't too many, but there are kind of uh, five elders that represent their primordial type. And I just make them almost like they know that they are gods on this on the planet. They just know that they're like the top the top dogs. And the way that they talk, the way they act, what they do, how they think is just like I don't know if you could quite get away from because they kind of act like gods because they sort of are gods. It just kind of it's just it is freeing to kind of not have to worry about the mortality and the and, and other things. That just like these are just like just entities. Like it's kind of it's an, it is a freeing way. You don't have to think about the human element at all. And some facts they just kind of go. They still have a motivation, but a lot of that other stuff just goes. And they can be, you know, really great villains or, or really uh, interesting heroes as well. Um, so I think in that sense, like you can, the shackles come off. So if you want to, you can go to some really, really cool places, and you don't have the baggage of worrying about are they getting sick, tired? You know, when they they have to do all the basic human necessities as well. You can just let all that go and just run with the imagination wherever you, wherever it will take you. Uh Excellent. And now, uh, how about you? Uh, sorry, I got it. I have to check my chart, you know. Um, uh, Andrea. Um, I feel like they can be a really, I mean, in, in the case of mine, where it's like they're a very closely bonded animal companion, I feel like they can be a really good catalyst for a character change because they know they're human so intimately. Like they're very supportive, like they're always there for them, but then at times they also call them on their issues. <laughs> So that I feel like it's kind of fun to have somebody that is always there. They're never really alone and who can kind of push them along that character path. Is there art of these critters somewhere? Uh, yeah, there's a lot actually. Like, uh, I feel like I might have seen it at some point. It's okay. You can. <laughs> I took right off of my bookshelf. <laughs> no, please. Get, get, get it while somebody's talking. Yes, we, yeah. we have to see this. Okay, this is like, there's some some art of them. I like that. It's oh two of the main characters. Oh so, my God. Like so they sort of look like dragons, but like mammals? They're like water, otter, cat dragon things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh my God, they're adorable. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, all right. Uh, how about you, Travis? What's what's liberating about uh, writing non-human characters? Well, I mean, I guess I can just conserve all my my pedantry for like grammar <laughs> and punctuation and continuity, and I don't have to I don't have to let any of it get on the fun parts. So that's that's pretty nice. Um, it's also nice to design your ideal pet. Um, I absolutely want a pug that has an owl's head and little bitty wings. So um, a lot I, of people I, do. I, I like having the governors taken off. Um, I, you know, I, that's what I appreciate about fantasy. Um, I guess that's all I got. <laughs> I'm just wondering like how, how much pedantry you save uh, for the uh, grammar and other stuff. Do you have an uh, unlimited well, I mean, reserve? I think it gets or... more and more concentrated. <laughs> I think that, you know, you diffuse it over the entire book, but if you don't let yourself spend your pedantry on like your character, then you have way more to dump on to the grammar and punctuation side of it. Oh, that's, yeah, and that's really where it belongs. Uh, how about you, Nick? Yeah, I think the kind of simple answer for me is I just I just like making stuff up. Um, and I think that's really why, I mean, I started writing <laughs> fantasy and sci-fi and that's kind of exclusively what I write. Just, I guess, the kind of escapism of getting to create these new well, characters, but also worlds and settings and, you know, magic systems or far, far away kind of sci-fi technology and everything. I think it's kind of what Michael touched on, just, you know, shackles are off. You can just kind of let your imagination go wild. Um, yeah, you can just come up with all these different ideas and just create something quite, quite new and, and sort of run with it. So for me, that's always the most kind of exciting thing, whether it's sci-fi or fantasy is just, yeah, just making something up and just developing it and yeah do you use sci-fi and i mean use sci-fi and fantasy for different things or do you just have certain ideas like oh this is a sci-fi idea or this is a fantasy idea um yeah i wouldn't say kind of approach them any any differently um i kind of if 
I think I come up with ideas, it tends to be in the same way. And I guess for me, my ideas sort of come as like a kind of rough concept at first and then I sort of flesh them out. So it's not like sci-fi is a particular vehicle for me to say one thing and fantasy is another. I think at the core of it, I'm hopefully, what if, if people have read my sci-fi stuff and go into the fantasy and vice versa, they're, they're quite similar in the sense that it's very much about um, kind of characters, character relationships, um, you know, fun worlds to sort of get lost in and, and things like that. So I think there is pretty similar across both genres for me. Okay, uh, thank you. All right, so uh, next I wanna talk about um, if you write, also if you write non-human characters and then you switch to writing human characters, uh, is it different? Like, uh, what is it like to write a human character after you've written a non-human character? Is it hard to switch back and forth? And if that's not relevant to you specifically, you can simply pass on, but I'm curious, Michael, or do you mostly that's write humans? Yeah, it's mostly, it's the characters are all, the characters and even in songs are are the humans and they they if they have a dragon the dragon is very prominent in their thoughts and it's it's almost like a character and a half because the, the the dragon's perspective is so linked to the humans that you get kind of a bit of both in one but the humans are the uh the the primary perspectives there so it's not difficult to switch because i'm not really ever switching <laughs> so, would you ever not... write from the point of view of dragons I've thought about it. People, people want me to, but um, give the people what they want. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe I would say maybe, maybe. How about that? Is that okay? <laughs> maybe. I, I mean, you do what you want. <laughs> um, uh, how about you, uh, Andrea? Writing? Oh, you have not yet written from the perspective of these characters, right? I have not, I mean, um, in my new series, I have non-human characters that I write from the perspective of, um, but they are fairly similar to humans. So generally you're not gonna get much difference there. Yeah, maybe maybe this question is simply a dud. Does anyone have an answer to this question, switching between human and non writing human and non-human characters? I think the like, only- Is it any different for you? I think the only challenge I ever have with it is, is less about perspective and more about time frame. Because in, in a lot of books, and mine included, like all these different people have different lifespans. So an elf is functionally immoral, and a dwarf lives several hundred years, and a person lives the standard lifespan. And, and yet, when they all get together, they tend to act like you know they're on the cast of Friends, and they're all you know thirty somethings or something like that. So keeping track of time spans can be uh, kind of a shift sometimes. For me, um, it's kind of like remembering, I suppose, the like the physiology and like body language of characters. So in my way stations, my sci-fi series, um, there's two point of view characters that are aliens, and quite a lot of time I'll have to remember that they don't have eyebrows to raise or you know <laughs> hair to run a hand through. And some so sometimes you kind of put in your normal like, kind of human body language or expressions that you use, and you have to kind of catch that and say no, they've got like a tail or they've got kind of spines on their neck or something and it's actually quite fun to use use that as a kind of descriptor of you know their emotions or or how they're reacting uh, or with different characters and stuff but yeah sometimes it's uh, you got to remember yeah what exactly they look like and what they can what they can use to express themselves do the selkies cook their food or do they eat like the raw fish? That's actually, there is in the, one of the chapters that they first meet, um, yeah, the, the Selkie character is like, you humans do really strange things with your food, but you know, it's edible, so. <laughs> are Selkies the same as Kelpies? Or is that a different thing? They are different, yeah. So Selkies. Oh. Are... <laughs> wow. Oh, uh, technical um, Scottish mythology here, here we go. Can't believe you so <laughs> So Selkies, um, yeah, so they are the like the seals. So they take the form of a seal yeah. and the water can kind of shed their pelt and then they'll just appear human on land. Kelpies are like the water horses. So uh, right, yeah, I, horse. I feel yeah. they kind of maybe fall more on like the, the monster side as opposed to like, so Selkies I would say are kind of, you know, self-aware and, and seem like kind of human characters. Whereas Kelpies, as far as I know, are more kind of like, yeah they'll drown people in rivers and stuff. They're, they're and, sorry, the, the more- Any more plans? Than... Any plans for Kelpies to appear in one of your books? Yeah, we have a couple of cameos oh. um, so far. Um, and actually, 
well, not diving too, too kind of far into spoilers and stuff, but there's kind of a, a subset of um, Selkies that are kind of, I suppose, more, more the bad guys, um, and they ride the the Kelpies as kind of like mounts and stuff. So you've got these kind of oh. ghostly water horses um, that, that, that that they ride. So yeah, they they feature in it a little bit. I'm trying to, I'm just one book out just now about kind of as I go into books two and three, you really want to kind of bring more kind of um, kind of the creatures and the monster side into it as well. I was thinking more of like an enemies to lovers romance type of situation. But... <laughs> Um, no. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. No spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, jeez, I got so lost in there. Uh, where, <laughs> where are we here? I think we're at Tazak. I think well, I, I think answered. he answered. He he answered. He talked about time scales. Yeah. Oh, okay. And I don't um, have a good answer. So okay, because all of you know, I. Oh yes, yes, yes. This is the one that was a bad question. Yes, that was that was on me. Well, uh, Nick, you really carried the weight for us all. Thank you so much. Uh, so I, I have a sort of a general, very general question. So is there, and some of you have touched on this, particularly uh, Travis seems to have a uh, his eye on this question fixed on it um, in a good way. Is there some like philosophical truth about the human condition that you're getting at by writing non-human characters? Maybe in the way that SFF in general gets at real world issues by adding that remove. Uh, is there something that you're trying to say or trying to do by using non-human characters that you couldn't do by just having humans? Uh, and let's maybe give a start with uh, Andrea. Um, that's hard for me to answer without big spoilers. So <laughs> there's, definite, there's definite reasons behind the non-human characters um, that have to do with the way that the world works and uh, some ecological thoughts that I had. <laughs> so, um, can you talk in sort of more general terms? I can. You use use you can do things with non-human characters that you couldn't do with human characters to show something about our world. That yeah, I mean um, the. So the Ocelin have like a very important role in the world. And when we start out the story, there are not very many of them. And there are very specific human related reasons behind that that you kind of find out as you go along. Um, and, you know, there's a lot to be said about the animal companionship as well. Just to me, it's like, I feel like people have that sense of being alone a lot and having that kind of companionship it's like somebody that always will understand you at your best and your worst and still like love you i feel like it's something that people always want and desire and need um so that was something that i was trying to get at but as far as like the greater world stuff um there's a reason for sure but i can't like go into super great detail about it that's fair uh, how about you travis um, I think one of the basic joys of reading is seeing yourself represented in the character, um, something that you relate to. And I think it's just even more special if they aren't human for whatever reason. I think that's just a more, um, a more intense version of the same feeling. I, I, that's been my experience anyway. No, no hazarded guesses as to why it might be. More it just lovely makes you to feel a little bit more special. A mouse or a it makes you, it's, you're more unique, and it makes you feel like what you are matters more. Like that is a little bit more special, you know. If you know, if this is something that I struggle with in real life, but also this character that I'm relating to happens to be an elf that's super awesome for whatever reason. I I don't know. It just makes me feel better about myself. There's some this other being who I find you know great interest in 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 their uh, how they represent themselves and what they are physically and how they move through the world they've got something in common with me. I don't know, that makes me feel good. Yeah, I, I hear you. When I was a kid, I always wanted to play a gnome illusionist in d and I don't really know why, but something about being this little short creature with a big nose that could cast illusions just made me happy, you know? And it's kind of what you said. It just makes you feel good to think of yourself as a different form and shape. I mean, I don't know. Why do we like to dress up? Why do we do cosplay? Yeah. Why, do we, why do we do these things? Because it... There's something enjoyable, innately enjoyable. It's a kind of escapism that I think largely we all relate to. And 
uh, you know, making that kind of explicit in the book is, I think, really powerful. I think it can cut to the heart of whatever you're saying, Travis, so you did the, the issue you want to tackle, or the representation you want to tackle, that you're actually widely stripping away some of the human uh, facade can make people less nitpicky or, or less like worried about some of the particulars, but you can just hit right into the emotion of the issue. And it comes through in this non-human character and it kind of comes through truer because you're not worried about how that how that character is behaving or how it's impacting it because they're not human, so it would be a little different anyway. But you can just dig into how it feels and how that how that comes through. Um, maybe a little easier, perhaps. Um, I mean, Ash is a blind dragon. I'm not blind by her cystic fibrosis. It's a slight, it's not the same thing. It's not, you know, they're not the same conditions. This is not, but you know, I, I have a sense of what it's like to live with something that impacts you daily and how you have to cope with that. And so I put that into Ash, even though he's a dragon and he's blind. This is not what I am, but you can put that emotion and that kind of experience into him. And people get a lot of that out. So whether it's, they don't have to be, they don't have to be blind, they don't have to have cystic fibrosis, but they could have some similar health condition or they might struggle with their health in some way and they can get something out of Ash. They don't have to have exactly what he has. And um, maybe just because it's not human, it just nudges it away. You're, 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 it lets the reader's mind wander and just inhabit that person easier or something like that in a strange way. I mean, I think so the, what you're saying is like a lot of what happens with superheroes, right? I mean, it's this, you get to turn up all the dials. So why is, why is yeah. Spider-Man one of the most relatable superheroes? He has all these very relatable properties as a human being, but then there's all the extra yeah. stuff and all the dials get turned up. It, uh, there's, yeah. there's something magic about that. It's so funny. You, as you were saying that, I was thinking, I have this argument with my mother-in-law sometimes who doesn't read anything speculative at all um, because it's not like not real. And I'm like, sometimes the speculative allows us to see the real things in a way that we couldn't if they weren't speculative, just like what you were saying. People don't want to face certain issues straight on, but they're easier to face sometimes if you add that extra, you know, irreality. Although I suppose not everybody really the books the same way and that's okay. Um, but your statement about that just very much hit home with uh, my thoughts on this. Um, Nick, did you have something to add on the topic of philosophical truth of human condition that you use? <laughs> yeah, I definitely didn't go in like looking to kind of, yeah, write anything like that. It was quite funny as when I started though, um, I suppose the, the kind of crux of the conflict between the sort of Selkies and the humans in the book is the fact that it's kind of set in sort of secondary world, Scottish inspired island in the sort of equivalent of golden age of piracy. So there's lots of kind of boats and trades and ships and obviously they're going out to the water and that's where the Selkies live. Um, and, you know, it's taken their territory, it's kind of displacing them. And suddenly I'm kind of realizing I'm sort of writing about environmental issues that I didn't really consciously go in to do about, but it's just the way it kind of evolved to kind of start to touch on that more. And that's always quite nice when you, I suppose, discover that you're actually you know, writing about something that you didn't think you were, so. Yes, yes, indeed. That reminds me of a book called Undiscovered, another Selkie book that uh, also has some environmental themes. Maybe there's something about Selkies and environmental stuff. Uh, how about you, uh, Zach? Yeah, I, I think um, I, I'm definitely attracted to the ability to kind of talk about human issues and stuff like that through, through non-human characters. So. My books explore like economic inequality and social injustice and all of these interesting lenses. And I think, you know, when I started doing that, I was I was more confident to do that because I was writing about non-humans. Uh, and, and, you know, obviously you can you can kind of like Michael was saying, strip some of that stuff away. Uh, one of the interesting things I found is I still had a couple of people kind of write to me after I published my first book and be like, hey, you know, I, I really like the book, but you know, this, this isn't quite right and stuff like that. And, you know, I, so I started hiring like a sensitivity reader for, for all of my books since then, just because, you know, um, even though, you know, it does give you some of that freedom, you know, you can still go into some areas that you weren't quite anticipating. So it's, it's interesting the way it works both ways. Yes. So you said sensitivity reader for which topics, like cultural topics or? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, 
I mean, a, a lot of the books are about like uh, income inequality and uh, social injustice. So I've had people, you know, read it for a lens of, you know, kind of race and stuff like that. I don't want any one fantasy people to stand in for any one human or uh, yes. yeah, human race. But at the same time, like you've got to you got to explore that. Uh, I started adding LGBTQ characters uh, to my book in the in the latest one, and I, because um, you know, again, I had a reader kind of say, "Hey, you're not representing us," and I was like, "You got me. I gotta I gotta do this." Um, but I wanted to make sure that I was representing that well, and there's interesting conversations because dwarves are weird about sex and stuff like that. So <laughs> it's just yeah, it, I can imagine. It gives me a lot of peace of mind to know that I'm not blundering through some social issue. Um, anyway, and they've, they've they've saved me some embarrassment, so it's been great. Excellent. I mean, I think essentially every reader or uh, they, they tend to just really ask good questions and make you stop and think in ways that you might not have done on your own. To me, that's been the sort of most useful thing. Um, and then Michael, you already spoke on this. Do you have anything else to add on the on the topic of, uh, you know, philosophical truths of the human condition, et cetera? No, I think I've said my piece on that. All right. <laughs> Excellent. Um, uh, so are there limits, somebody mentioned this earlier, are there limits to how, for lack of a, for lack of a better word, alien of a human, of a non-human character, you would be comfortable trying to write? Uh, would you try to write something that's completely uh, not, you know, far away from a human? Somebody mentioned like silicone based life form. I mean, how far would you try to go as a writer, um, you know, in some hypothetical future work, uh, how far would you be comfortable stretching yourself uh, in this case? Would you let's start with you, Travis? I suppose it depends on what I was trying to accomplish. Um, I don't always plan to write the same kind of books, so I guess it depends on my goal for the book. Um, I'm, I, I don't think I would ever take anything off the table for myself, um, because why do that? Um, so I, I, it feels like a cop-out answer, but I think that's my actual answer. So do you see yourself being a fantasy writer, or do you think you would delve into sci-fi, for example, at some point? I have I have some sci-fi books that I'm interested in writing. Um, I have a fantasy that is decidedly not cozy that I'm interested in writing. Um, I'm I'm pretty genre genre agnostic. I just happened to write this first. <laughs> I got it. Well, you 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 made a good choice if it was a choice uh, to write that one first, for sure. Yeah, what's that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> how about you, Andrea? Um. I mean, I don't have any current ideas. I could definitely see myself doing it in the future uh, just because some of the books that I really enjoy are ones that have very different non-human characters, like A Fire Upon the Deep with the aliens where they have like five in a group and that's like their, uh, I'm like trying to remember exactly what they're called, but like uh, they exist in groups of five basically and that's one con consciousness. Um, and then also like Adrian Tchaikovsky's uh, recent sci-fi books, like Children of Time, Children of Ruin, where they're uplifted, um, uh, Spiders in One and uh, Octopi in another. Like I just, I really enjoy the different places that those go and the, the different ways that they think because they are not human and the different ways that they interact with one another. So I could see myself doing that in the future, but currently I don't, I don't have any ideas off the top of my head, so. Right on. Uh, how about you, Michael? Would you go? Uh, would you go with some really wild, far out, uh, non-human character type, or do you think you're likely to stick closer to home? I think I'd be willing to go. Again, it depends what was needed for the story. It depends what was needed to, to you know. I wouldn't want to go to some strange place just for the sake of it, but I'd be I'd be willing to do it. Uh, I think it'd be really fun, but I think I'd probably keep it quite you know short and sweet. Kind of less is more. Um, I think it could, it might, you know, at, at, at some point we, we are reading stories to kind of root for characters and it's all, it is all about people, uh, even if it's not, you know, you want to get, I feel like you don't want to stray too far, at least I don't want to stray too far, I just think, because I want to bring it back and make sure people are engaged. And so if you went very, very, like there's some really crazy entities in this series that if I was to write their perspective for a scene, that might be an interesting scene, but if it starts to become a bit longer than that, I think it could kind of get away from the point. So can you, uh, I, yeah, be willing to go. Yeah, go on, so. Can you tell us a little bit about one of these entities just to give us a sense for what you're talking about without spoiling well, like, too much? Uh, it's been spoiled too much, no, because it's been revealed like the, the kind of the big and the big existential horrible force in this world is this like 
It's called the Scourge. It's kind of a combination of the Zerg from StarCraft, kind of zombies, kind of uh, the White Walkers, Dragon, like Dark Spawn from Dragon Age, like all these things kind of blended up. I mean, horrible. Uh, but the thing that kind of controls it is just we just refer to it as the hive mind because it's meant to be this sort of insectoid thing. What's the ones from Halo called? Uh, the Flood. It's all this kind of stuff built up, but this hive mind has been revealed to be getting a little more intelligent, a little stronger, and has its own goals and motivations and agendas. And so, you know, I could you could see a scene or a couple of scenes where you could write from its perspective, but it's just so bizarrely alien because it wasn't it was some it was some other creature that got corrupted by some bad magic that grew out and, became, and it's just this like you know it's so unhuman because we have a single head and we think in this from a single thought perspective but it'd be very difficult to put yourself into like that position of i'm an entity that also has a million other entities in my head i'm in control but i'm also all these things at the same time like it'd be be very it'd be a, huge challenge and i think you could maybe pull it off for like a, a a good strong scene but if you try to make it longer than that um it might get it might be a bit too much you know you want to evolve it might be a very powerful thing and it's short and sweet um so it's, it's when you're moving away from things that think completely differently from us and have different would have different uh, structures so like yeah if robots don't if it was a, an android that doesn't feel that could be very difficult if it's this insectoid creature that is a hive mind rather than a single mind. I mean, that's when it would get very difficult and uh, maybe a little too alien for readers to want to stay with for a long period of time. Uh, but that's my two cents. Maybe I'm wrong. That's my two cents. Well, I think that sounds like a really cool POV, but I do agree that a little might go a long way for that one. Uh, how about you, Zach? Yeah, I mean, on that note, like I, in, in my latest book, there's a a few paragraphs scene where there's some sort of insectoid monster that's getting eager to eat someone and jump out and ambush them and then you know the rest of the scene plays on and it doesn't go well for the creature but like that's about as far as i'd go i i think it, and it, i don't know if it's less my comfort and or if it's you know that i wouldn't be comfortable writing them anymore i just i think it's less interesting to me so i all respect to the the you know children of time and and, and stuff like that you know I, I think they're it can be done well and for people who are really interested in it, that'd be awesome but um beyond like a a single scene or a way to cast light on more human characters i just i don't think i'd be as interested in it. Quick question, was the insectoid creature of equivalent intelligence to the dwarves in the scene? No, nope. Okay, got it. Um, how about you, uh, Nick? Yes, yeah, so in the way the trilogy, the sci-fi one, um, mild spoilers, I suppose, but in kind of books two and three, we sort of see that the sort of an overarching antagonist is a, a sort of like hive mind, um, like what Michael touched on. And yeah, I think it is really tricky to to write for that perspective, not even write from that perspective, but to go into too much detail because it's meant to be something that like the, the human characters, the point of view characters can't comprehend. So the, the moment you try and make it make sense or put too much detail into it, it, that kind of, you know, the tension and the unknown is sort of stripped away, I guess. So you kind of want it to be a little bit vague, a little bit fuzzy so that there's more of that kind of dread I think the closest really get is in book two one of the point of view characters um sort of wakes up in the hive mind and she's sort of trying to navigate it and sort of find a way out so you're kind of getting a sense of the scale of it and you know what what it's wanting to do but you never really kind of get into motivations like you would either human character or kind of non-human character who's more similar to a human because if you're coming at it from the point of view as a human, it's just too kind of vast and you know incomprehensible. So I think yeah, it's that it's that balance that if you try to go into it too much, I think it would take some of that that mystery intention away. Yeah. Has anyone here ever written from the POV of someone who's dead or like undead? Uh, yeah, a, a little Not bit. <laughs> I, kind of. <laughs> Because that's kind of weird too. Like if if you write from the point of view of someone who's who's long dead and they come back to life, it, it's it feels alien in the same sort of way a little bit. Well, it, in my second book, uh, like there's a, there's a character who dies early on and then gets you know brought up as part of the undead army, but he 
this basically goes back to old habits and tries to get himself a middle management job so he can slack off. <laughs> <laughs> That's so depressing. <laughs> uh, well, switch, switching gears completely, but um, we can't we can't talk about, or at least I can't talk about non-human characters with a talk, without talking about a perpetual hot topic in SFF, monster love. Can we say monster fucking on air? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, well, just briefly, in fairness, not not all non-human characters are monstrous. In fact, most of the ones that we're writing probably aren't. But uh, my real question is, do you write sex scenes with non-human characters? Uh, and if so, uh, tell me about any of the benefits or challenges uh, writing intimacy from these perspectives. And I'm going to start, well, I'm going to turn it free, but I, I, I have a quick question for Travis. I think a lot of people would, would ask, what, what influenced your choice to pull the curtain in uh, Legends and Lattes? Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm just a big softy. I, uh, you know, I, the, the, the stated goal for Legends and Lattes was basically to make like a Hallmark movie in the Forgotten Realm. So it's sort of in the vein of a Hallmark movie. They're going to fade to black or pan to blowing curtains or something. So um, I'm not object. I don't object to sex scenes or, you know, or erotica, but it just didn't seem appropriate to the story. Um, and it fair. also just didn't seem appropriate to the characters and the arc of their relationship because their relationship was really kind of like a, almost like a C plot. It was effectively, uh, an evolution of Viv's character and a series of brave, but mundane choices that didn't have anything to do with killing anything. And the last brave choice for her was, do I take something that's a friendship and find out if it's something else? So to do more than that would have felt like it was maybe undermining the moment. T totally fair. Uh, anybody else have, uh, have they, anybody written scenes of intimacy with non-human characters? Don't do a lot of intimacy in my books, so. Just smooth. I, ha I, ha I have, um, the, in my next series, I mean, nobody gets down with the Oslin, that's not a thing. <laughs> 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 but in my next series, there are, there are gods, and then there are also another kind of people called altered, and um, they are non-human. However, as one of my character states, like their physiology is different, but not that different. So, so it's not like I don't have to get too complicated or different with the. But I mean, like um, the moral mores, traditions, customs, etc. I mean, is anything different or interesting? Just wondering if that, if you approach it differently than you would writing humans, human scenes is all I'm only question. Uh, you know, just because the, some of the physiology is a little bit different, like, um, some of them have wings and things like that. So that's a little bit different. Um, but yeah, I haven't really gotten, I've only written the first book. so. <laughs> I'm not... Okay. That's fair. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to push anybody on this. I just thought I would, I thought I would see. As people are pointing out in the uh, in the chat, that's a different panel. Next year, maybe we'll have this panel. <laughs> and I'll I be might on. have more to say by then, too. Right? <laughs> Any, anybody else? Okay, uh, moving on. What is your favorite non-human character that somebody else wrote? Uh, and we'll start with uh, Andrea. Oh, wait, you just talked, but that's okay. You can talk I some just more. Talked. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, I have a very <laughs> ready answer, answer for this, and that's... Uh, Night Eyes in um, Robin Hobb's books. Uh, he's a wolf and he bonds with the main character Fitz and it's, it's yeah, he's amazing and the relationship is incredible. It's just, it's so well written and she does, she's like, I feel like Robin Hobb must be like one of the most empathetic people alive because the way that she, she writes her characters, including the non-human ones, like you feel so deeply for them. So anyways, it's like hands down, it's night eyes for sure. And we're getting multiple uh, agreements uh, in the comments about all this. Uh, people are loving on your answer and on night eyes. Um, how about uh, how about you, Michael? Favorite non-human character uh, from well, that somebody mind, else wrote? The suddenly, the horrible moment when the mind suddenly goes completely blank uh I, I specifically non-human can be can be hard to find sometimes i think the one that jumps to mind probably because i caught up with cradle at the end of last year is orphos from all right's cradle uh 
just he's a he's a giant fire he's a giant turtle who thinks he's a dragon or pretends like he's a dragon so the contrast was always funny there and he was always a nice bit of uh, comic relief for the series um goes around eating rocks and wood and it's generally aggressive and grumpy so he really calls to me spiritually in that sense as well uh yeah off uh shepherds off from cradle series what was the last one Excuse, so you repeat yourself from would you repeat yourself from the cradle series? You said it was Orthos. Oh, I'll just Orthos, okay. Sorry, uh, the character is called Orthos. Okay, got it. Uh, how about you, Zach? Uh, so I, I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of the uh, guards series of Pratchett's. So, uh, you know, uh, Cherry Lodabotton and uh, Corporal Angua, and uh, I guess, I guess Captain Carrot is technically a dwarf. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess he is. By the way, uh, as those of you who are listening in, uh, if you want to drop, if you have any questions, you're welcome to drop them in the chat. We may have time to get to them, uh, depending on how things roll here. Um, and uh, Nick, yeah, I really like kind of animal companions too. Like Andrew was saying, Night Eyes is just absolutely one of the best. Um, I love Mephi too. Mephi's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, and. In terms of sci-fi non-human characters, I just I love all of um, Becky Chambers' alien characters and her Wayfarers series. I think she writes them like so well, and each of them have like their own kind of distinct culture and stuff. Um, and although all the books kind of stand alone, you kind of meet the same sort of aliens throughout throughout them. And yeah, I think they're they're amazing. <clears throat> Excellent. How about you, Travis? Well, I was going to say Orthos, and I feel like I had a right to that because I voice him. <laughs> but um, uh, as a backup, I will say a non-human character that isn't even a creature, and it's Frank the Axe from uh, Kyle Kieran's Shade Slinger series, The Ripple System, who's basically um, you Danny also DeVito was. from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia as an axe. Um, and he's amazing. I, I don't suppose you could grace us with a line from Ortho in his voice or in their voice. Uh, Orthos? Yes. What? Um, the dragon advances. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so let's take a moment to give some advice. There probably are a few authors or would be authors out there. What advice would you give an author writing the non human characters for the first time? Uh, and we'll start with Michael on this one. Oh man, um, I would say, I would say, don't. I would say actually, I know it's not human, but try to, try to think of them as find what the human element is first, and the human emotion or motivation is first, and kind of build outward from there. Because in this, it's, it's a story. Where you have we're going to connect it to something else in the story, and it's got to relate to some of the other characters. And so, it's good to know where this character sits within that framework no matter what they end up being and no matter what other quirks they have from as being non-human like you have to find that core truth to them first and then the rest is almost window dressing like with anything else you've got to find that that starting point and do you feel like it, when you go back and you look at your first book and what you've written since then do you can you see the progression or do you feel like uh you you sort of got it you got that that aspect of it uh, early on. Well, I like to think I'm always getting better. Otherwise, what's the point? But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I think it's uh, some of the stuff you think of after the fact. I wouldn't claim to like sit down ever and be like, I, I have this exact framework and I think of all these things all the way through very carefully. So a lot of it's done by instinct. Um, but I think I know that I suddenly feel like I can write the scene well, or I feel like the scene is complete with the characters coming together when I start to feel like I have a grasp on those elements of them. And sometimes that happens at the planning stage and sometimes that happens as I'm writing it. Um, but I know that usually this is a sort of thing of after the fact, I know when, I, when it's working and I can explain why afterwards, but in the moment, you're kind of doing it by instinct, right? Um, so I think I've gotten a bit better at trying to plan ahead for that, yeah. That makes sense. Uh, how about you, Andrea, any advice for writers uh, working on first um, 
non writing non human characters for the first time? Uh, uh, I feel like that's like it's it's just such a broad question because there's so many different kinds of non human characters that you can write. It's like you you've got like anywhere from somebody that's like undead or somebody that's humanoid to like a very animal like character. Uh, I guess it's like a lot of the normal stuff that you would think about when it comes to characters, like what's motivating them, what are they afraid of. Um, it can be very different depending on how different from a human your character is. Uh, gosh, yeah, I, I think that's, <laughs> it's, I don't have anything specific off the top that's, of my head. That's perfectly fine. How about you, Travis? I mean, uh, I guess my advice would be not to use the fact that they are no a non-human character as a way of uh, supplanting the important things that make up a character. The things that make up a character are still important, that they have wants and needs and interests and that they change over the course of the book. And just because they have wings and a cool catchphrase doesn't sudden, that doesn't, that doesn't take the place of actual character building. So just don't forget that they're still a character, that they still need all of that important stuff. Um, and just because the window dressing makes them more visually special. Yeah, I think it's true. And I think a lot of beginning writers tend to get all caught up in the exactly what you said, the window dressing. And then they will sometimes have this very highly decorated shell that's maybe a little bit hollow inside. I think that's good advice. Uh, how about you, Nick? Advice to writers trying to write uh, non-human characters for the first time? Yeah, I mean, for just echoing what everyone else said about, you know, getting to sort of the heart of that character and still thinking about the sort of experiences that you kind of want that character to, to sort of convey in the story. And um, one thing I quite like to do is I suppose take, you know, an aspect of like, human experience or like a generalization and then sort of try and flip it or, or ask questions of it. Like to take a really kind of flippant example, like, I mean, most humans wear clothes. So if one of my early <laughs> Macy's don't wear clothes, why don't they wear clothes? What might that say about them, you know, as a group, as a culture, and just kind of use it, even if it's not necessarily plot, like plot important, um, to kind of use it as a vehicle to sort of explore them a bit more. And it, I guess it kind of then just like snowballs and you kind of get more ideas. So that can be, yeah, a quite simple exercise just to kind of start thinking about the differences that, that might be there. Excellent. And uh, Zach? Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, kind of planning out uh, more about the background of that of that people and and what they're like and how they work culturally and how their lifespan or habit of wearing clothes or not or whatever impacts them. I think that planning can be really valuable because it gives you something to come back to as you're writing in terms of looking at the idioms they use and the mannerisms and stuff like that and really help them um, come across as a separate person. And I, I think when i read books the most interesting non-humans are the ones who do have that kind of like this is this is where i come from they have culture they have background it's not just a person with you know like wings and superpowers or something like that like you you want to have that sense of a uh, uh, people behind it so um some preparation in advance can go a long way excellent um well we're gonna um we're gonna be wrapping up within the next uh little while and i'm gonna ask the authors if you have uh, some books handy to get them even handier because we're going to talk a little bit about what books you have currently out and then we're going to talk about what books you have out coming up and so if anybody has a question the last minute question this is going to be your chance to ask it uh first of all i want to start with travis do you happen to have any copies of your books handy that you could hold up to the camera to show us by any chance? I don't. I'm in a box. Uh, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> tell, us, the box. <laughs> uh, tell us what books you have currently out. Uh, Legends and Lattes and Bookshops and Bone Dust, uh, which is a prequel to Legends and Lattes, are both out at present. All right. And you say it, when you say it is a prequel, it, does it feature some, how many of the same characters? Oh, it might be a spoiler, but um, okay. at least some two. of the same characters. Okay, at least two. <laughs> got, got it. Okay, uh, and how about you, uh, Andrea? Oh well, I guess since I grabbed it off the shelf, I have that's the third in um, my Drowning Empire trilogy, uh, the Bone Shard War. So yeah, it's a complete series now. 
I have the first book in my new series, um, The Gods Below, is coming out in September. So for those who don't know The Bone Shard War, what's the, um, can you give us a like, you know, brief pitch? What is it about? Uh, you know, like just a one second pitch for an entire trilogy. That's oh, all I'm asking yeah, for. So I, I mean, it follows like five point of view characters. It is epic fantasy. There is a daughter who's trying to reclaim her rightful place as heir. There is a smuggler who is trying to find his missing wife. There are two women in an established relationship who are dealing with the class differences between them. And there's a woman on a remote island who is trying to figure out how she got there and why she is there. Um, that's kind of the setup for the first book. And it does have bone jar magic, which is um, inspired by computer programming. So that kind of covers most of it. And Beth Tabler, uh, before we go blog, wants to know what uh, that special edition is from that you were holding up. Oh, uh, that is the fairy loot edition, which, oh my God. Oh, okay, I just have to, I have to show you like- Please. They, they, did, they did this. Uh, so that's like underneath the dust jacket. Um, I will, I will never get over this. It's, Can yeah. we see the, uh, the pages, the, not the oh. spine, but the, oh, yeah, the there you go. Edges. Yeah. Edges. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Just, Very like, nice. An author bingo thing for me before I was even. An and author. Crystal wants to know if copies are still available or if they're all gone. They're all gone. Sorry. There's gra grabby hands in the chat. Oh, well, <laughs> well, that's what you get for waiting, Crystal. Uh, okay. How about you? How about you, Nick? Yeah, um, so you can see my uh, very, oh, the side, the side, strategically placed. You, we're we're going to no, need them a little prepared. closer to the oh, camera. Right. Put them up close so we can't see those. Um, so I've got my, um, the sci fi ones here. So this is the Waste Stations trilogy, which starts with those left behind. Um, and we've got those ones forgotten. And those who resist. So that's uh, yeah, completed sort of space opera trilogy. Um, I would say for fan um, things like The Expanse or Mass Effect, um, Star Wars. It's very much lots of different planets, different alien races, um, lots of kind of action and sort of character uh, relationships. Um, and then Sea of Souls, which I do have handy, um, is my new foray into fantasy. So yeah, as I touched on before, that's like um, kind of Scottish inspired, um, quite heavy on folklore. Um, it's about a runaway noble um, who's kind of spent the last few years sailing the seas and kind of has to come home when sort of tragedy strikes at home. Um, that she then has to sort of team up um, with the sail key to track down this lost pelt um, and might be the only thing that can sort of stop these kind of mysterious attacks on the island that they both live on. So yeah, if you kind of like sort of folklore um, and magic and mythology, um, yeah, that one's, that one's maybe for you. Outstanding, how about you, Zach? Uh, so I'm best known for uh, the Dark Prophet Saga, P-R-O-F-I. Hold it up a little closer. There we go. So, oh, yes, yes. Orconomics. Starts with Orconomics. Uh, the second book is Son of a Lich, and the third book is Dragon Fired. Uh, book three uh, was released last year as an ebook, and audiobook and print are coming out later this year. Um, we have a question from uh, Beth Tabler once again. Zach, how is the Kickstarter going? I hope <laughs> the answer is well. Otherwise, that's a rough question, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so, Orthonomics did win uh, SKFBO four, I think, it, the 2018 one, and then uh, the Kickstarter is going well. I'm waiting for my proofs on the prints uh, for the for the uh, hardbacks, and then uh, it should be shipping later this year. Excellent. Uh, how about you, Michael? Uh, so, this is Ascendant, which is the first book in the Songs of Chaos series. There should be five by the time it's over. I'm working on the fourth one at the moment. Uh, so it's a nice big Dragon Rider epic, kind of has a timeless feel to it. That's what I was aiming for. So I've got people who are very young that read it. I've got folk who are very, quite old that read it. I know there's a lot of families that listen to it in the car, on old car rides, uh, and everyone seems to get along with it. So, uh, and people compare it very, very favorably to Inheritance. So if you're kind of in the mood for a real timeless Dragon Rider classic, maybe check it out. It's about a servant boy who saves the blind dragon from death and then rises to become a dragon rider. And just to give Travis a solid, in case you're one of the few people in the world that hasn't seen 
It's the broken binding edition, so you've got the nice spray. Ooh. Excellent. Well, and then Crystal Natar would probably bully me if I did not I'd briefly show you this book, which is called Jag Dra Jagged Shard. It is a dwarven lesbian dungeon crawler romance. And this one, which is called Wings So Soft, which is a fantasy romance. There you go, Crystal. All right. <clears throat> Last thing we have before we wrap up. Uh, tell us where we can find you on the internet. And if you hang out on any social media, which ones they are. Uh, Michael, we'll start with you. Sure, yeah, uh, you can find me on my website at michaelarmella.co.uk. All my links to my socials go from there. Uh, I have a Discord server, which I think is particularly fun. We've got uh, about 1,400 people in there and they chat books and films and TV and all sorts. So you can come hang out and chat if you wish. And we will put, if you guys wouldn't mind putting those in the private chat and we'll somehow find a way to transfer that information to the, actually you can drop your links in the public chat. I don't see why not, right? Go for it. All right, and how about you, Zach? Where can people find you on the World Wide Web? Uh, so the easiest spot is my website, jzacharypike.com. Um, I'm hanging out more on threads these days than uh, Twitter or uh, Facebook. So if you want to message me directly, I'll, I'll respond to any of them, but threads is the fastest. Excellent. And Travis, if someone wants to cyber stalk you, how can they do that? Um, I've got a website, travisbaldry.com. Maybe I'll update it someday. Probably not, but it does have contact links on it. Um, I'm probably on Twitter the most. I do have an active Discord server. Thank you, Chris. Link to on my site, and uh, but mostly that's narration focused. So I do a lot of live narration work there. Um, apart from that, I, I, I'm sure I've camped the at Travis Baldry handle on whatever social media there is, and will occasionally visit it. Right on. Uh, Andrew, I know I see you on Twitter once in a while posting a hairstyle or a book. But, uh... <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's andreagstewart.com for my website and then at Andrea G. Stewart for Twitter and Instagram. And sadly, I've dragged my old withering carcass over to TikTok. So I'm on there as well. Right on. Um, OK, and how about you, Nick? Yeah, I'm the same. I'm mainly on Twitter and Instagram and also TikTok as well now and then. Um, so I'm just at um, Scrim Scribes uh, on all the channels. So yeah, first four letters of my name makes it a little bit easier to remember. Right on. Uh, and I unfortunately uh, spend way too much time on Twitter.com. Um, well, unless there, I don't see any questions in the chat. So it looks like we are just about ready to wrap up here. Um, so thank you very much for joining the very first panel on TBRCon, TBRCon 2024. Thank you to Michael Miller, uh, Zachary Pike, NC Scrimger, Andrea Stewart, and Travis Baldry. I'm Danny Finn, and thanks for tuning in. Please remember that this episode will be available uh, here, and I think it's also going to be available, unless I'm very much mistaken, uh, uh, as a podcast uh, coming in uh, probably a few weeks. Thanks for tuning in and please check out all the other amazing panels coming up. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.